Oh, that's the wrong button. Three, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the meeting of the Audit Committee for October 19th, 2021. The Board of Education, the Board of Education's October 13th, 2020 resolution provided that in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of, of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend these portions, those portions of the meeting that are pursuant to the Maryland Opens Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. Accordingly, today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually. It is also being broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live. The link is provided on the board's website and board docs. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be conducted by a roll call. Board members will say their names before making or seconding a motion, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, at its courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jameson if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum may be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of the quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Joes. Pastor? Yes, present. Oh? Here. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Jamison, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Anna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Strait. Ms. Sample. Present. Two. Present. Four. Mr. Edwards? Dr. Scriven? Mr. Saris? Ms. Burnout? Present. Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? I believe someone said Ms. Causey was on the call. Excuse me, Ms. Jamison? Is Miss, I, I believe someone said Miss Causey was on the call, but I'm not sure. Miss Causey confirmed that she, maybe maybe she's on mute. She confirmed that she, she received the call in number and she called in. Okay, thank you. Hearing thank no additional you. names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Okay, great. Our next item, according to board docs, is opening remarks. I have no opening remarks. The second item is unfinished business. For that, I turn it over to Ms. Barr. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Good afternoon. Uh, I decided to keep the unfinished business UHYOLA update on the agenda because I had committed to do that um, starting in September. However, I wanted to inform the committee that this particular update is actually included under new business in our Q1 update. Thank you. Okay, we move on to new business. For that, I call Ms. Barr, Ms. Manna, Ms. Stevens, and Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Mr. Mc Mr. McMillian, again. Um, this year, I just wanted to point out to the committee that the way that we are presenting our updates is a little bit different. As the committee is aware, we've begun to um, complete a risk-based work plan. So the information and documents were included in board docs for your, your review. And I'll just go through the um, quarter one report um, project by project. And then um, the chief auditor quarterly hotline report will be presented by Mr. Fletcher. As part of the overview of the regular audit activities, Ms. Manna also has a very targeted um, 
presentation related to the risk assessment that we're in the process of completing. So as we go through the uh, um, audit activity report, I want to make sure that everyone is again aware that this is a risk based audit plan and as a result, things change, prioritize, priorities um, can change and move around. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands that um, moving forward. Also, I wanted to point out that due to unforeseen circumstances, we did have a bit of a delay in posting our um, audit reports to the web page. Uh, we're, we're working on getting that practice resumed as soon as possible. But as you know, we do provide regular updates here at the audit committee meeting meetings, and we would be happy to respond to any questions that you would have um, throughout the year. So I will just start with the regular audit activities. As mentioned, Mr. Fletcher will um, be providing a report about the fraud, waste and abuse hotline administration under a separate report. And Ms. Mana will be providing a PowerPoint presentation related to the entity wide risk assessment later on in this meeting. So we'll start with the first um, audit activity, which is carryover projects. And the, the objective of the carryover projects is to make sure that uh, we complete anything that was open from the prior year. And as the committee will recall, we primarily had um, three projects that were uh, carried over from the previous year. And then we did have some agreed upon procedures for um, some other projects that we had to carry over. So um, I will turn it over now to Ms. Manna to give the update related to the UHY Corrective Action Plan and the OLA Corrective Action Plan. And then when Ms. Manna is completed with her updates, I will then ask Ms. Stevens to give an update about the benefits deduction reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barr. As the quarter one report indicates on the carryover projects um, for UHY, we have completed observations number uh, one, two, four, five, and seven. They are all related to the purchasing, um, purchasing related findings and central office review of procurement cards. We're waiting on requested documents and additional information for the two outstanding observations, which is number three and, and six, which are also related to uh, purchasing. Our draft report is currently in the supervisory review phase, and we plan to send the sections of the report to the applicable management when it's completed. Uh, this review will help solidify our language in the draft report, and it will also establish new target deadlines for completion of the observations that have been determined to be in process. We'll we will communicate and present more details of observations one through seven at a future audit committee meeting. And the final report will also be presented um, when it's completed and we've had an opportunity to work with management to review the details of the report. So I'm going to move on to OLA update. Um, not much progress has been made since the last audit committee meeting, except for some validation of the information that we received for the IT related findings. As also indicated in the Q1 and quarter one um, report, We've completed test work for finding number three, which is related to the pricing of purchasing of school buses, and we're wrapping up the four IT findings as well. We'll begin to do more follow up and monitoring with the remaining findings, and we plan to focus uh, more time on this project once the UHI follow up monitoring is complete. And again, here we'll communicate and present the status of the OLA results at a future audit committee meeting as it's completed. That is all I have for both UHY and OLA update at this time. Are there any questions from board members? Ms. Pastor? No questions, Ms. McMillian, thank you. Yeah, Ms. Joes did not call in. Ms. Rowe? Any questions? No, sir. Thank you. OK, Ms. Barr. OK, so these agreed upon procedures. We spent a lot of time related to the benefits deduction reconciliation, and I would just like Ms. Stevens to 
I'll present a brief overview of that project. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, so the benefits deduction reconciliation project um, related to the deductions that are taken biweekly for our employees um, benefits. Um, for those who may not know, employee benefits are based on a calendar year, not a fiscal year. Um, employees can add, delete, or change benefits during open enrollment only, um, at, which is held at the end of each year, unless there's some kind of um, life uh, change that would cause them to change their benefits. Um, deductions for the benefits that are elected um, around this time of the year uh, will then begin to be taken out of the first pay in January. So due to the cyber attack, um, we lost a lot of information um, regarding employees pay with that. Um, the amounts that were paid um, by employees for their benefits for calendar year 2021 were not accurate, and that's for two reasons. The amounts that were deducted in the first pay period of January were based on the prior year's benefits uh, elections, and this did affect both base and hourly employees. Additionally, the benefit codes and rates for some employees who had made changes during open enrollment um, were not updated in advantage until later in the year. Um, most of them had been um, updated by March of 2021. So for this reason, um, the benefits office requested assistance from us to verify the amounts that were owed to or by approximately 800 employees who had made changes to their benefits during open enrollment. As we were looking at the data that was available to complete the verification, we determined that we could not only uh, verify the amounts for those employees, but for most of the other employees as well. So benefits asked us to do that. We um, worked with 13,685 affected employees. So the Office of Business Management Information Systems was instrumental in our completion of this project. They um, very quickly provided the data files that we needed for our analytics. So using our data analytics software and the files provided, uh, we determined the monies that were either owed to or by employees for each benefit type that they receive. We compiled all that information by employee and looked at um, the outliers and the anomalies in those amounts. So anybody that either owed a lot of money um, in total or um, was owed a lot of money in total, we went into the HR system and kind of delved, delved into why that why that had happened and to justify that it was um, actually due. Uh, we have turned that information over to um, the appropriate levels of management. We were actually able to verify 13,218 employees. Um, we had 467 employees that were excluded from the stratification um, that need to be reviewed manually um, just because we just didn't have the correct data for them. Um, we're also continuing to work with the Department of Human Resources to determine if data is available that, so that we can perform a similar analytics for the retiree benefits. That's it, any questions? Ms. Pastor, any questions? Very clear, no thank you. Ms. Rowe? So this was just the benefits you audit you did? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. So this is just benefits that you audited and this is not the accuracy of income stated on pay stubs? That's right. And okay. it, it was not an it was not an audit. We were just uh, looking at the amounts that were paid um, by employees and whether they were accurate or not. Oh, okay. So you looked at what the employee paid into benefits, how that appeared on their pay stub, and whether that was in fact what they paid. It, it was whether or not that was what they should have paid. So. Okay. So this doesn't explain why, even though the General Assembly has board members making seven thousand five hundred a year, my pay stub still says I made twelve thousand this year. I can't help you with that one. I'm not not sure. Okay, because we're still getting reports from people aside from board members who are employees of the school system who say that their cumulative income amounts for the year are wrong. Mr. Rev, well, um, this, this is George this Sarah, is oh, and uh, we are still making corrections to the year-to-date 
information, uh, which uh, was is associated with the corrections for the W-2s that we made in March and April, and uh, we expect to have it. Uh, well, it has to be resolved uh, by November because that's when we start preparing the W-2s for 2021. So your year to date data will be uh, adjusted um, as necessary. OK, so this will be resolved before we issue W-2s? Correct. It has to be and it will be. OK, great, because I'd hate to have another press release from the comptroller's office about our school system a year later. I agree wholeheartedly. Thank you. That's all my questions, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. I have a question. So the we have over 18,000 employees total, I think. So this 13,000 number, how, how was that derived? It was derived from the data that we received from BMIS. So this would only be um, employees who are receiving um, benefits. So, so you guys got all that information for 13,000 people and then you went through it to look for mistakes, either whether they were paying more or, or less. Is that right? Correct. We, we looked at what they actually paid and what they should have paid and determine what that difference was. OK, now would it be presumptuous of me to assume that the other 5,000 people don't receive our benefits? I would assume I would make that assumption. Isn't that interesting? OK, thank you. Uh, Ms. Barr, back to you. Yes, thank you. So the next audit activity that we have in our work plan is with respect to peer review. And um, what we're doing this year is is preparing for peer review. It's it's the most recognized um, type and level of inspection, if you will, with respect to internal audit departments to ensure that we're uh, compliant with internal auditing standards, that the quality of our audit, audit processes are where they should be. And we also are um, using that and making sure that when we upgrade to our new electronic work paper system, that everything aligns with that. So um, in order to not have to necessarily pay for a peer review, you can volunteer to be a, a member of ALGA and be on a peer review team. And that benefits in, in more than one way because you get to know and understand what the peer review team would be would be looking for and then it minimizes or reduces the cost um, or the, eliminates the cost for uh, actual peer review to be conducted. So we have done that and made sure that one of our uh, staff is registered and we've reviewed the documents necessary um, in relation to the ALGA peer review and have gotten quite a bit um, done related to that with with respect to the specific form about organization and our con quality control system. And the red book, it is the standards uh, that our office is going to follow in the completion of all of its work. So we've actually purchased the updated red book um, and we're up getting the general understanding of these red book standards and doing the research necessary to make sure that everything that we do in our office aligns with these red book standards including our SOPs, our audit processes, etc. And this is a, again a widely recognized um, review process for internal audit departments in the industry. Um, similar and comparable I, I would guess to the um, the review that is done by the CAFR and and the budget just to you know make sure that we're doing things the best way that we can. Any questions related to, to peer review preparation? Ms. Pastor? 
No, sir. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. And I have no questions. Okay, Ms. Barr. Okay. Mr. McMillian, this is yes. Ms. Causey. Yes. Good afternoon. How are you? Um, great. Thank you. I was able to connect. Um, so I had a question, if I may. Go ahead. So for the peer review, um, will it then result in a um, final assessment the same as if there was an actual review done? Well, it is. It, first of all, I'll start backwards. It is an actual review and yes, it does um, result in a report and most folks um, actually post um, that report on their website. So that would be my intention is to post that report once we've gone under that review. I can, I know um, my counterpart in um, PG County, they undergo a, a peer review. Now they follow yellow book standards, but they, they post their review results on their website as well. And that is my intention once the review is completed. Oh, okay. Cause um, it was unclear to me. So what is uh, the difference between the cost for an actual review and the cost of joining in the peer review? So the, I don't know the actual cost um, today of a peer review in the past when we have um, solicited quotes, bids, or not bids, but quotes, things of that nature. It was pretty cost prohibitive. I know it can range anywhere from in the, the mid to high 30,000 and greater depending on on the extent. So what we have done is in lieu of paying that we have um, or I have allowed an individual on the staff to volunteer. So what happens is that person has to participate um, in at least one peer review. So that would be a matter of perhaps um, three to five business days for that individual to participate in a peer review of another organization. And I thought that that was uh, uh, made sense as far as saving costs. And again, then that that also in a way provides staff development for that individual who is participating because as you're participating on a peer review team, you get to learn more um, from other organizations and how they operate. Okay, I see. Thank you for that. Sure. Okay, Ms. Barr, another report. Yes, yeah, so our um, indirect audit activities such as meetings, we do w meet weekly in the office to talk about our project status every Monday. We conduct monthly staff meetings. We do listen to all um, Board of Education meetings and I have for this year for the first time assigned um, individuals in the office to listen to every single committee meeting. So two individuals are assigned to each committee and then they do a report on um, you know what they've learned to the committee so that we don't all have to listen to the committees. They committee meetings, they provide the highlights back to the entire office. Naturally, we meet with um, this committee every month and then I meet monthly with the superintendent, the chief human resource officer, general counsel and business services executive leadership. We do um, maintain our professional development CPEs and I wanted to congratulate two of our senior auditors, um, Ms. Jamison, Andrea Jamison, who earned her master's degree in education on her own time and um, Ms. Lauren Crew, who earned her master's degree in public administration on her own, own time. I know they spent many nights till midnight, one o'clock getting things done. So I just wanted to take uh, the opportunity to congratulate both of them on earning their master's degree. Congratulations. Yeah, really, congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. <clears throat> and then we have um, general office responsibilities that we need to complete, monitoring the budget, um, payroll timesheets. We don't have, um, an executive admin assistant. So a lot of that of, of those responsibilities have been divided up amongst the staff. Um, we have spent some time um, obtaining new software 
and going through that process, we have we review our SOPs for relevance and determine um, which ones still need to be created. And then um, we did the quarter one update report preparation. So that was just some of the general responsibilities that we completed in the first quarter. We did also with respect to audit follow ups begin planning for the review of our high school money handling procedures. Um, that was the only piece of the follow up that we completed in the first quarter. And then um, you'll recall that at our, I believe it was our June audit committee meeting that um, the committee was very concerned that we still continue to do something with respect to those new incoming principles and the financial activity or financial um, transactions. So we did have to put that under special audit request and unplanned audits. And we have gone to 24 of the 31 um, where there were changes in administration and completed financial reviews there. Um, Ms. Manna, did you want to add anything to that? We will plan to do a uh, summary review or summary report of this whole project probably at a, um, the next or December's audit committee meeting. But what I can say here right now is that we did do a limited review just to ensure that the financial transition went from the outgoing to the incoming principal. And we reviewed their money handling procedures, which is a, a big area to make sure that the controls are in place. Thank you. And then the last um, project on under audit activities completed in the first quarter is related to workers' compensation. We did a project and actually it was ongoing um, from the previous fiscal year, but in this year we started it anew. We had a um, we have a third party administrator for workers compensation, um, short name Cisco. And when we did a review last year, we identified um, some questions, concerns about the cost containment services that were indicated uh, in the contract and were being provided to Baltimore County Public Schools. So as of September 30, we were able to issue an interim memo, update memo to management that identified our concerns and risks and that project will actually be completed um, and the final report issued. I'm, I'm hoping to get that out this week so that at the next audit committee meeting, um, we'll, we'll be able to provide more information to the committee under the reports uh, section of the agenda. Uh, before I go into the um, the planned audits not yet started, are there any questions related to any information provided so far? Ms. Pastor, any questions? No questions. Ms. Rowe? No questions. And no questions for me. Priest. Please proceed, Ms. Barr. OK, and then the last part of our um, uh, update with respect to audit activities are the planned audits that we have not yet started. And you'll see um, what we've included is a projected start date by by the quarter of the fiscal year. So it gives us a range. And again, it it ties into the information that we are learning as we're conducting the risk assessment. So as I said in the beginning, uh, some of these projects may drop in prioritization. They may come off, they, they may move up, something else um, may take its place. Uh, one thing that is not on here because it started in the second quarter relates to the blueprint for Maryland's future. So you'll be hearing a lot about that at upcoming um, audit committee meetings. So uh, basically we have, um, to be started in this quarter is the FY21 overtime payments. We have started that project. Um, contract review for all third party administrator contracts. We have done um, some limited review related to that already. We have the student data enrollment attendance um, and we have started that, that project already. And um, the IT security, uh, we have not started that yet, but that is scheduled to start in this quarter between October and December. And then those further out are the benefits eligibility in quarter three. Um, we thought better to push that out once open enrollment is complete and we'll assess and validate um, to make sure dependents are eligible. We have contract processes 
also in quarter three. And payroll going back to um, perhaps sort of related to Ms. Rose's earlier question about assessing the um, adequacy of the payroll internal control structure. So um, that may or may not tie into what you were referring to, Ms. Rowe. And then, of course, we have to do our employee evaluations. That would not be done until quarter four. Leave balances in quarter four, fixed asset inventory, and a review um, related to the internal controls over fiscal processes is scheduled for, for quarter four. And that's as of right now today as we are speaking, because again, I can't mention enough that when we do a risk assessment, risk assessment priorities change. And I believe that is a good segue into um, Ms. Mana's presentation as to where we are so far with respect to the risk assessment uh, project. So Mr. Corns, if you could please um, bring up the PowerPoint presentation related to risk assessment for Ms. Manna. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barr and Mr. Corns for bringing that up. Um, you can go ahead to slide two, please. This first slide provides additional background to reemphasize the purpose and importance of our entity wide risk assessment. Uh, our risk assessment activities will identify and analyze the processes in situations that may negatively impact BCPS, its students, employees, and other assets. Our risk assessment activities are helping us to gain a better understanding of the organization's key business processes and functions. And we're doing that in order to gain a shared perspective on risk across the organization. This will allow us to identify the risk exposure and control gaps. And the end result of our risk assessment will help us to determine and prioritize the internal audits resources and focus, and will support the projects in our audit plan as well. OK, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. This slide indicates the risk factors that were discussed with all of the members of the superintendent's cabinet. Our discussions of these risk factors determined the level of extent that their division was impacted by these factors. We discussed and reviewed their interactions with the external public, whether their division is considered mission critical to BCPS's goals and objectives or the compass, um, whether the, their division is more of a support role to the other department's goals, and if there would be a negative public coverage of if their division would fail to achieve their goals. Um, we also looked at how their division spends within their adopted budget, whether or not their division tracks performance metrics of their activities, if there are any governmental or other regulations that would impact their activities, and if there's consequences for any non-compliance. We also looked at how their division was impacted by the cyber attack and how it may have been um, maybe impacted by the efficiency study if recommendations are implemented. Um, and the next slide, please. This also displays some uh, risk factors that we reviewed and analyzed ourselves using the budget. Um, we looked at each division's um, FTE and the allocated budgets for FY21 and 22 and compared the total FTE and adopted budgets, um, their FTE and adopted budgets to the grand total. And this chart represents the totals for each division. And next, Keith's going to um, chime in and talk about how we're where we are now with the project and where we're heading in the next steps for the entity wide risk assessment. And you can go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Ms. Manna, and thank you, Mr. Corns, uh, for jumping back to that slide. And so as we go through and, and conduct this process, uh, keeping in mind that the crucial part of the risk assessment process is to communicate with management. Uh, and so what we've done to this point is interviewed the superintendent's cabinet members. Um, and now, uh, now that we've completed those interviews, what we're in the process of doing uh, is meeting and interviewing with the executive directors and other levels of management um, that that are process owners as we go through. Uh, and again, the goal is really to attempt to identify the risks related to the processes and controls for the, their related departments and offices. 
So if we jump to the next slide, Mr. Corns. Um, so as we go through and conduct these interviews, um, we are going to assess and rate the risks, um, complete risk ratings. And what we're doing is utilizing all of our internal audit staff uh, in this risk identification process based upon their experience and knowledge. Uh, so essentially bringing some of their biases and, and experience and things that they've encountered um, and, and bring it forward so that we can clearly identify uh, risks that we know are out there. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a risk assessment is, is truly a fluid product. So uh, any organizational changes uh, or anything like that is able to be immediately considered um, into the, the, uh, the risk model itself. And if we hop to the next slide, Mr. Corns, really just want to um, kind of talk through, this is a, a matrix that we're utilizing. Um, and so as we go through, and again, we're talking eight divisions, 26 departments, 72 offices, um, and we're doing this matrix here for each of those um, 72 offices that, that drive up into those departments and divisions. And what we're, we're doing is identifying um, the specified objectives, and most of these objectives have, have been pulled directly from the, um, uh, from the annual budget book. And what we're able to do is tie those objectives back to the compass uh, as, as you look at this chart here, kind of working backwards from the middle. Um, so we identify that back to the compass and then moving forward, that's where we work with management and process owners uh, as well as, you know, the, the members of the internal audit staff. And we're going to identify those risks and controls that are in place that tie back to those objectives. Um, and so ultimately what that will allow us to do is, is um, complete um, this this risk assessment model as as we go through and and work with um, management to do that and so as mr corns as we slide to the the next slide um miss Barr, i turn it back to you for any questions and i would turn it back to mr mcmillian if any uh, committee members have any questions related to the risk assessment and what we have completed so far Ms. pastor any questions? Not yet, but one's coming. OK, Ms. Rowe, any questions? No. And I have no questions. OK, thank you. Then um, uh, Mr. Corns, if you would bring up the chief auditor's quarterly uh, fraud hotline report. Yes, that's them. Thank you. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're looking at uh, presenting information in a different format to the committee. And as we present this report, Mr. Fletcher will go through it section by section and explain um, each part of, uh, of that as his normal presentation. In the past, you were used to looking at some statistical charts and graphs but we've changed it up a little bit th that um, we hope is providing more information um, to the audit committee with respect to the types of um, hotline reports that we receive and the types of investigations that we complete. So once we're done presenting this, I would appreciate any feedback from committee members related to the type of information presented in, in both reports really on the quarter one report and the hotline report. But right now I'll turn it over to Mr. Fletcher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Barr. And Mr. Corns, if you would uh, slide down to page three. Thank you right there is perfect. And so as Ms. Barr said, we're really taking the, the same type of information that we've already been presenting to you month after month uh, and giving it to you in a little bit of a different format to hopefully uh, provide some clarity and, and um, um, make it more um, comprehensive for you uh, each time. So what we want to talk about here uh, are the cases that we received. And uh, again, we're talking the first quarter, so July 1 of 
2021 through September 30th, 2021. Um, we received 27 cases. Um, and again, keep in mind, cases can, can be phoned in through our hotline. They can be, um, the, the, a reporter can go in and, and enter it into the uh, website uh, from our third party as well. Uh, or it could just be something that is called into our office or, or forwarded to us from a different department. Uh, so we received 27 uh, during the first quarter. 13 of those uh, were determined that would be held and, and investigated by an internal audit. Three were referred to BCPS management for their investigation. And then 11 were not in the pur purview of the hotline and were actually, uh, we were able to close with a memo to file. Now, the as we go through, we're, we're gonna talk about those three different uh, types of differentiations uh, in a little bit more detail, um, but we'll, we'll go ahead and, and continue first with uh, the breakdown. So as you, as you saw before, uh, of the 13 cases that that internal audit kept for investigation, this is a breakdown uh, very similar to what we've seen in the past in, in the different uh, uh, charts and graphs. Uh, so as you can see, five were considered conflict of interest. Uh, one was a falsification of record. Three were payroll fraud. Um, and then one each of misuse of, of resources and theft, and then two were considered employee behavior. Uh, and then again, three were sent to BCPS management and 11 uh, were closed with memo to file. And so that does total up into our 27 um, cases received for the first quarter. And Mr. Corns, if we can slide down to that next page, please. Uh, so now we're gonna talk about the status of the cases received. Um, and so in addition to the 27 new cases that came in, uh, we had 45 cases that were already open uh, at the beginning of quarter one. And that gave us 72 total cases that were open during, at, at some point during the first quarter of fiscal year 22. And at the end of this quarter, uh, 42 cases were closed and 30 remain open. And so this table here is essentially a breakdown. Um, so again, when we talk about the cases open, that first line says open as of uh, July 1, 2021. Those are the 45 cases that were open at that time, uh, whether they're being actively investigated uh, or had just come in. And then the second line is, is uh, the 27 cases that came in during the quarter. Uh, so again, during that quarter, uh, there were at one point, there were 72 cases that were open. And then the second half of this table, we talk about what was closed. Uh, and so for those that were closed, uh, you can see that we do have substantiation levels. So 16 internal audit investigations were closed. And you can see the substantiations there, uh, whether they were substantiated, unsubstantiated, or inconclusive. And then um, we would have that also, there weren't any for this quarter, but you'd see we would have that there for the management investigations as well. And then we had 26 cases that were actually memos to file that we closed. Uh, so during the, the first quarter of uh, 2000, I'm sorry, the first quarter um, of this fiscal year, we did close 42. And that very last line, that tells us where we are uh, with open cases as of October 1st, as of the end of September. And so there are 16 internal audit investigations that are currently open, uh, that were currently open as of September 30. There are 13 management investigations uh, for a total of 29, and then we had one memo to file. And our next three tables are really going to be um, the, the substance of what those numbers are. And so, Mr. Corns, if we slide down to our next page, we're going to talk about internal audit investigations. Perfect. And so this table uh, is a summary of the 32 open of, uh, open internal audit investigations during the first quarter of fiscal year 22. And uh, again, this detail is not something we've typically presented in the past, um, but we wanted to give a little bit more information uh, as to, to what types of cases uh, were coming through. And so you can see uh, the, the amount of detail is provided for each one. Um, but as you scroll through, you'll see that we, what we ended up doing is we closed uh, 16, investigations and Mr. Corns, if you continue to scroll to the next page, you'll see once we get to the 17th record, now we're looking at our, so there's our open. Uh, once we get to 17, you'll see that we now have, um, these are our open investigations, things that we're currently um, going through and reviewing. 
and then uh, ironically enough, so we had 16 that were closed and now 16 that are, are still open as of September 30th. And so that's for the internal audit investigations. Uh, the, the, again, those are the ones that we keep in house um, and, and we conduct the investigations. The next table, as we go to the next page, I believe it's gonna be page seven of the PDF. Thank you, it's perfect. Um, these are the management investigations. And so we review, or I'm sorry, when a case comes in, uh, sometimes it's more appropriate for management to review and, and we ask for a response back and we'll take that response and, and provide it um, and, and use that information to close the investigation. And so we review management's uh, uh, results to ensure that they provide sufficient evidence to close the case. Um, and then we'll go through that process and as you can see, as we scroll through this table, um, we do have 13. And again, we uh, providing um, the information very similar to the table above. We do have 13 uh, that were open as of the end of September 30th. Um, and so that information is there. And then as we head to our next page, thank you, Mr. Corns, that's perfect. These are the, the um, cases that come in through our hotline that um, may not, there may not be a need for either internal audit or BCPS management to investigate. Um, and so that could be instances where uh, the information provided doesn't, it's not an allegation of fraud, waste, or abuse, uh, or perhaps the reporter didn't provide enough information for us to investigate, and we've reached out to them requesting additional information and, and we don't receive anything back. Um, or uh, management's already aware and, and has already been a, uh, begun addressing an issue. Uh, things like that, or perhaps it's already been something that that we have investigated. Um, and so in, in those instances, what we will do, um, we'll, we'll utilize a, a memo to file uh, to acknowledge the case and, and close it. Um, but in most cases, uh, what we'll still do is provide the case details to whatever appropriate level of management uh, so that they're aware that it did come in through our hotline. Uh, and so as we scroll through this table, uh, this is uh, the 27 memos to file um, from the first quarter, and you'll see we did close 26 of them, and we still have one open. Uh, and if I recall correctly, the one open is we've re we've requested information from the reporter, but we haven't received anything back just yet. So, uh, if I had to guess, it's probably something that that if not has already been closed, it'll be closed shortly. And so that is the end of of. Uh, this presentation, um, Mr. McMillian and Ms. Barr, turn it back over to you for any questions. Ms. Pastor, any questions? Um, not right now. I need to process it in my head before I say it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Barr, I'd just like to state that I really appreciate the detail in this report. Uh, it just gives a lot of information that, and whether it's me and, and studying it to a, a, a greater detail, but there's a lot of information on breaking down these different, these different uh, cases. So I, you, personally, I've, I appreciate that. It just gives us a chance, it gives me the opportunity to see what I'm looking at, to see the detail in it. So I thank you for that. Ms. Mr. Barr, and, excuse me, I'm oh, sorry. Mr. McMillian, can I, okay, I sort of have my question now. Outstanding, go ahead. All right, um, in the report where, and we looked at the chart and then it showed closed and certain things happened. Where are the details did you say that and I just missed it, but where are the details? If I were just looking at that and you weren't here um, to say it went somewhere, how would one know where the details about the case, what happened, um, where it went? Am I making this clear? I can't, if you, can you go back to a chart and I can show you what I mean, maybe? Sure, uh, Mr. Corns, if, if you would go to page five, I believe is, is what Ms. Pasteur is talking about. Uh, 
Okay. Um, scroll, I'm sorry, scroll up one more. Yeah. I apologize. Thank you. Uh, one more page. Perfect, perfect. So Ms. Pasteur, is this is this what you mean here? So if if these are cases that our office has conducted um, mm -hmm. and, and issued a report and in, in terms of the, the exact detail of the resolution. Yes. So, so the last the last column talks about whether something was substantiated or, or unsubstantiated. Right. Um, Ms. Barr, would you like to, to talk more, I guess, about the issuance of our reports? Sure. So <clears throat> once we um, complete a report, it goes to um, the superintendent, um, the law office, and the chief human resource officer. That's our normal distribution. Of course, you know that once um, we've determined that all appeal, appeals have been exhausted, then the board members do get the investigation reports. If you're talking about the human resource dis disposition, if there is a need for um, some type of, of disciplinary action, um, we do now have a process with the Department of Human Resources where once they have reviewed our information and they have um, made a determination as to whether or not there, there is a need for consequence, they do notify our office we call it HR dispos dispositions, and they do let us know what happens as a result of the work that we do. It, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I just okay. um, wanted to know just what the steps are or what the process is uh, other than seeing this chart. If I were just looking at this or someone else was were looking at it and I was trying to explain to them this is what it looks like etc cetera, etc cetera. and they'd say okay but what does that mean inconclusive based on what uh, what happened to it and i just wanted to know what what the other pieces were and you just explained it very nicely um what the different levels are and where the material is yes that answers it perfectly thank you you're welcome uh, Mr. Fletcher, do you want to explain a little bit about the different results? Um, we used to we used to actually have the definitions in our previous um, updates and work plans, but we did not include that. We could in the future include that as an exhibit just so that you have all those definitions um, included with the report, if that would be helpful. Sure, and uh, Mr. Corns, if you would uh, scroll up just one page, I believe. Um, yes, sir, right there is perfect. And so if you look to the left, uh, we talk about our, our different substantiations for our cases closed, uh, where we have substantiated, partially substantiated, inconclusive, and then unsubstantiated. Um, so talk about the, the, absolute, the, the two absolutes for substantiated versus unsubstantiated. When we issue a report and we've indicated that the allegation has been substantiated. Um, it essentially means that we have um, documented evidence that whatever uh, activity has been alleged that it's correct. It is it is factually uh, accurate. Um, and essentially, as as we discuss it internally, we we basically say, I'm able to sit in court, put my hand on the Bible and say, yes, this happened. Uh, same thing for unsubstantiated. It's, it's the it's the exact opposite. So we have documentation to show that whatever it is that was alleged did not occur. Um, and so those are the, the, the two polar opposites, but they're they're both very absolute. Um, what you'll notice is that we we do have that gray area of inconclusive, meaning we cannot prove uh, that an allegation did or did not occur, or I'm sorry, that whatever activity uh, that was alleged did or did not occur. Um, now, what we will have is, um, you know, when we go through and conduct our investigations, we, we look at documentation, we look at um, employee files, sometimes we'll, we'll do all types of, of uh, documentary review, but we also conduct interviews uh, speak to people. Speak to people that were um, either impacted or were um, a part of whatever had, was alleged. And even though 
sometimes evidence may point in a specific direction, uh, or you know we're sitting here with a, with a, again with our own biases or or um, uh, you know based upon our experience we we think this is what happened. Um, essentially, if something is inconclusive, we're unable to um, w without one hundred percent doubt prove that it did or did not happen. And so. I, I hope that helps explain. I, I didn't really talk about partially substantiated. Uh, I think that's kind of self self explanatory when when you think about substantiated. Uh, it, it essentially means that as part of the allegation, um, as you know, if you think of it this way, they got they got some of it right, but but some of it is is either um, incorrect or just um, not necessarily um, complete in terms of what was alleged. Okay, Ms. Farr, Ms. Causey has a question about the HR disposition. Ms. Causey? Good afternoon again, and thank you. Just to dovetail with uh, Board Member Pasteur, when the HR dispositions are communicated to the Office of Internal Audit, then does that get um, included into the next quarterly update to the Audit Committee? Uh, no, we have not communicated. Um, we have not communicated that information to the audit committee with respect to what happens to an employee. And that's kind of like a personnel matter. I don't know that that it could be. Because keep in mind, that... keep in mind, Miss Causey, that that once um, it's been determined that all all appeals have been exhausted. Board members do get the actual reports that are provided to the superintendent, to human resources, um, and to the general counsel. So, uh, but I mean, we do have a record of what happened in our office related to the individual with respect to the disposition, but we have not communicated that. I don't know if that's appropriate to communicate or not, but I could follow up on that and follow through on that um, and let the committee know next meeting. Thank you, Ms. Barr. Thank you for that. Yes, and so I didn't uh, expect there to be specific personnel information. Uh, maybe just, you know, action was taken or no action was taken in terms of understanding, um, you know, the positive impact of the work that is done. OK, I got gotcha. you. Uh, that's general enough action taken versus no action taken. Thank you. Ms. Barr, is, does this conclude the reports? Yes, Mr. McMillian, this concludes our report for the meeting today. OK, now I overlooked the approval of the minutes earlier in the agenda, so I just want to state that. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand approved as recorded. OK, thank you. Uh, the next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, November 16th, 2021 at 4.30 p.m. And in conclusion, I want to again point out and congratulate Andrea Jameson and Lauren Crew for earning their master's degrees. I think that's, you know, they deserve a, lot, a big pat on the back for that. So congratulations. Excellent. Outstanding. Now, I've lost my, oh, let's see, I've lost something here. Okay, here we go. May, is there any further business? Ms. Pastor? No, sir. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey, would you like to say anything? No, thank you. Okay. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved, Rowe. May I have a second? Second, Ms. Pastor. Thank the both of you. Uh, Ms. Jameson, may I have a roll call vote? Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Rowe? 
Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Thank you. We have confirmed three votes. Since there's no further business this evening, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for attending. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening.